Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patrick Verone. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to all of you out there in Zoom land and the future generations of all of you who will be watching this recording on your retinal implant. We begin our tribute to John Bowman with his wife of four decades, Shannon Gone Bowman. Hi, everybody. I'm so, uh, I can't tell you how touched and pleased I am that you're all here, how uh, very touched John is. Um, this is a photo of John at 17 after a high school football game. It's the only photo he ever kept of himself from high school. Now, his friends know there is no recap of John's life that doesn't mention football. <laughs> he loved football. He loved to watch it a lot. He loved to read about it and he loved to talk about it with his friends or frankly, any stranger that shared the interest. <laughs> I'm afraid that in spite of living 40 years together, that was never me. <laughs> Early on in our relationship, I asked him why he loved football so much. And he said, well, I suppose because I played it and it was by far the most important thing I did in high school. Now, John, as you might imagine, did a lot of things in high school. And I asked him why on earth football was the most important to him. And he answered that it was because it taught him one very crucial life lesson. What was that? I asked, fully expecting to hear the importance of teamwork or self-discipline. But that wasn't his answer. John said, I learned that I could go into every game and be hit as hard as the other guy could possibly hit me and the world wouldn't come to an end. So it taught me to never be afraid of a fight. I was so stunned that the answer wasn't team spirit, <laughs> that I didn't have a follow-up question. Although I remember later thinking, not afraid of a fight? Did he mean physically or just with me? Well, as we went through life together, I saw again and again what John meant. He fought for me, he fought for his children, and he fought for his work. He fought to keep a vision for his shows in spite of, let's say, less than helpful network executive notes. He fought for his actors to shine. He fought to hire the writers that he wanted to hire. And ultimately, he fought that what I will tell you was a very great personal cost, a very difficult battle to get all writers their fair share of profits in what was a completely new medium. Um, now, you may know that after college, John went to Harvard Business School. And even though he was delighted to leave his job when he got the offer to write for Saturday Night Live, that MBA came in pretty handy. After all, as Lauren Michaels liked to say, they don't call it show, show. <laughs> well, John got an A in negotiating. And I'll never forget the night he came back from the negotiating table the first night, and he was stunned. And he said, they actually began this negotiation over streaming, over downloading, with how about zero percentage? for you writers. And in fact, how about we relook at residuals as a whole and rethink whether you get them? And he had never, as a professional businessman, heard of such an amateurish stance. Uh, as he tried to point out, this wasn't an ugly divorce fight. It was a negotiation between the people who make the profit that you all make profits off of, who make the product, and you. Well, 
it truly helped that John knew his numbers. It truly helped that he knew how to find out from Wall Street that they weren't projecting zero profits from streaming. They were projecting billions. And he knew that you can lie all you want to to writers, but you can't lie to Wall Street. So he stood firm. And I can tell you that, uh, and he hated every single day of that strike. He thought it was stupid. He couldn't believe they were willing to shut down one of America's most profitable industries. It frustrated him as a business person that they negotiated like that. It hurt him himself with his own money and it upset him how much it was hurting other writers and workers in the business. Well, one night the phone rang at home and it rang off the hook, I can tell you, all day and night long. There was cell phones, but they filled up very quickly. And there was no secretary for Patrick or John. So they called the house. And I always answered just in case something, some breakthrough. And I never heard so many F-bombs in my entire life. Some of which came from other writers as they were panicking. And uh, one night the phone rang and it was John's agent. And he was pretty rattled. And he said, is John there? This is really important. I said, no, and I don't know what time he'll be home. He said, have him call me no matter what time. I'll tell you what happened, Shannon. The lawyers for the other side have called and said they're gonna personally sue John for over $5 million if he keeps on encouraging writers to stay out on strike. So I need, they want a response tomorrow and I need to know what John wants me to say. So I hung up and I waited for John to come home. And by the time he did hours later, I was pretty worked up myself. Uh, we didn't have $5 million laying around and we had five children in private school uh, and a house that we had put everything into the down payment. So I told John what happened. I asked him, are you gonna call back? And he said, no, I'm going to go to bed. And I said, how can you go to sleep? I said, John, this is, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, what is your response? What do you want? What do you want your agent to tell them tomorrow? And he said, I want him to tell them that they can go fuck themselves. And then he went to sleep. <laughs> And well, I thought, you know what? I can go to sleep now too, because if John's not afraid, then I'm not afraid. And it turned out that John was right. He held firm. He, with the own special skills he had, he kept together what is a herd of cats, writers and showrunners and uh, agents and uh, the heads of the studios. And um, they uh, back down. And there is the percentage for streaming. And that makes a huge difference in all of our lives. And I can tell you one last piece of advice to the, any young writers that are out there who might not remember this time. Stay involved. I saw I quoted John's to um, a letter he wrote to the Writers Guild members. Stay engaged, stay knowledgeable. There's gonna be other, this isn't the last medium to come along. Know the numbers and when you, and demand to talk to the actual heads of the studios. Don't talk to their lawyers. I mean, you have to, but don't pay attention to them. And when you do get invited over to Peter Chernin's house for a scotch and a little conversation, wear a suit. Don't wear a flannel shirt and your baseball cap. <laughs> and you'll come out all right. I almost forgot. And now there's a short video of the highlights of John's time 
on screen. And the Emmy goes to the writing team of Saturday Night Live. Jim Dunn, John Corman, A. Whitney Brown, Gregory Daniel, Tom Davis, Al Franken, Janet Cohen, Jack Handy, Bill Hartman, Lauren Michaels, Mike Tom Myers, Conan O'Brien, Bob Odenkirk, Kurt Sargent, Tom Schiller, Robert Schmeigel, Bonnie Turner, Terry Turner, Christine Zander, and George Meyer. The Dan Quayle Show, starring Dan Quayle, Rosemary, Maury Amsterdam, Tucker Quayle, and Marilyn Quayle. Move right along, yo, I love you. Harry Hamlin and Victoria oh. Jackson. Oh, Harry, I love you on L.A. Law. You're a big, sexy star, and I love you for it. And pretty, pretty Victoria. Now, where might I have seen you lately? Saturday Night Live. Uh-huh. New cast or original cast? New cast. Harry, your table's waiting. Victoria, take it outside. Take it outside. <laughs> take it outside. Take it outside. Let me see the Let me see. As I'm sure all of you know, the Alamo is now besieged by 3,000 Mexican soldiers. Excuse me, sir. I, I heard it was 4,000. Well, it may be 4,000 by now, I'm not sure. I heard it was 5,000. Well, 4,000, 5,000, whatever it is, it's a lot. You see, sometimes a man steps up to a typewriter thinking of themselves, trying to hit a home run, but the team gets nothing. <laughs> Now, that was merely a demonstration. You see, even though we've won an Emmy, I don't want anybody resting on their laurels. He was a by-the-book cop teamed up with an out-on-a-limb rebel. Don't do it, you're gonna get us killed! Relax, I've done this before. <laughs> Relax, I told you not to, right? They don't pay me enough for this job. Side by side, they took on Los Angeles. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I'm John Bowman, chairman of the negotiating committee. And I understand uh, there's some showrunners out here today, am I right? Good, I, I want you not to worry because your shows are in good hands right now. Uh, your conflicted characters have, thanks to a last minute rewrite by your current executives, finally found happiness. The stakes on your shows have never been higher. Nor have your comic roles been filled with so many attractive yet unfunny people. And I hope you like close-ups because your current executive slash editors sure do. Oh yeah. Look, I'm TiVoing everything, everything on TV this December. Look, I, I want to say to all of you how much, hey! Look, I'm not a performer, I'm a writer. I, I want to I tell all of you how much I appreciate your sacrifice, everybody's sacrifice. Every gain this guild has ever made, pension and health, residuals, jurisdiction, resulted from people like you sacrificing your immediate interests for the greater good of the community. And we are a community, and we help each other and support each other, and that's what we're doing here today. Showrunners have responded as a community too, and I appreciate that so much. You are first and foremost writers, and I know you take your obligations to the writing community very seriously, and as chair of your negotiating committee, I thank you. Your resolve only strengthens our position at the table. Some of you have been sued, and it doesn't surprise me. Lawyers are the Pinkerton goons of this particular negotiation. A few days ago, Nick Counter said it would be a month, at least, before his side would return to the table. Well, okay, 
There comes a time in every broken relationship when someone has to be the bigger man, so let that bigger man be me. AMPTP, I love you. And I know, at least when I have a show on the air for four years, instead of going six and out, I know AMPTP that you love me too. This whole thing has been 100% my fault. When I called your rollbacks draconian, that was a liquor talking, not me. So come back to the table, baby. We can work this out. We made the lawyers rich. Now let's put our differences aside and make each other rich. Whether it's now, a month from now, six months from now, it's up to you. To AMPTP, look, as long as you come to the table with a fair deal, we'll wait for you. I don't care how long it is. It's going to take, however long it takes, we'll be there waiting for you with open arms. Now let's stop this, get back to the table, negotiate, and bring writers a fair deal. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Bowman, Chairman of the Negotiating Committee of the Writers Guild of America. This is my son, Jesse, who's been uh, thoroughly radicalized by this experience this afternoon. It's so great to see everybody's galvanized by the justice of our cause, and everybody, even though they've been up since 6 a.m., a lot of them are still here marching and still willing to stay longer. It's, uh, it's actually quite inspiring. All this sign of solidarity and unity does nothing but help us with the negotiating kit. When you have uh, a management that's as uh, intransigent and as wrong and unwilling to be flexible as this one is, it, it unites us as much as anything does. Plus the fact that I, I think this is an issue that crosses TV writers, screenwriters, uh, everybody knows how important the future is, how important the internet is. Everybody knows this is our one last chance. And uh, they're sort of putting our backs up against the wall, and nobody's backing down. So it is, uh, it's actually quite inspiring to see. I mean, look, how you treat a partner is, you're going to the internet, and you sit down with them and say, hey, there's this new thing, let's, let's figure this out. We're going to pay you. You know, obviously you're going to get paid because we have this ongoing relationship with you. But instead what they did was they just streamed our, our TV shows for nothing, unilaterally imposed a rate for, uh, for streaming on our, or for downloads on iTunes, and then said, hey, this is what we're going to give you. What are you going to do? Uh, so they, that, the idea that we're their partners, I think, you know, you, you don't really treat your partner with this degree of contempt. Yeah, they've been, look, they're cynical, they're businessmen. If they can get away with it, they will. If we fold because they've succeeded in manipulating us, uh, they're going to try it. And the only way we can counter it is by staying strong and united and negotiating with them when they finally decide they're serious about negotiating from a position of unity and strength. Yeah. Come over here. I'm not going to hit you in the face. Come on. I want to give you a kiss. Close to pie. That'll teach you, you sucker. Boom, boom, boom. Hey, Cordy, come over here. Give me a little kissy poo. Little kissy poo right here. Come here, sweetheart. No, no way was that. Sweetheart, I won't, I won't hit you this time. I'm sorry. You know me, Nicholas. I get crazy sometimes. No, please, come over. I'll give you a kiss. Look, my hand's over here. I won't hit you. See? Okay. Kapow. <laughs> hey, that Nicholas is a wise guy. I first met John Bowman on December 4th, 1978. I can pinpoint that date exactly because it was during our week-long initiation into the Harvard Lampoon. Um, we were in the same room together the night before. I don't remember that first night because, well, there was some drinking involved. Um, but the next day, I was sent off to do some foolish errand and as I was dragging my tired, hungover, demoralized, thoroughly hazed self back to the Lampoon Castle for more of the same, John came bounding towards me, yelling at the top of his lungs, my long lost lover. <laughs> he bear hugged me, picked me up and spun me around. I never asked him, but I assume he was told to do this. Needless to say, this was a bonding experience. My other early memories of John from those years are hazy. Again, there was drinking involved. But my next distinct memory was the next semester when my time on the Lampoon had uh, taken its toll on my academic record. 
We were eating in the Adams House dining hall, and I lamented that I would now never get into law school, and my future was doomed. John was conciliatory, but also a bit dismissive, saying, yeah, but you had fun. <laughs> Over the next 44 years, John and I traveled the same roads, intersecting often. We married our college sweethearts, whom we had met on the Lampoon. We squandered our graduate educations to become comedy writers, raised families in the Pacific Palisades for a time on the same street. We went to the same church, served on the same alumni boards, went to the same parties, hung with the same social network. Our birthdays were only a day apart at the end of September, and every year we both get the same email from Mike Reese saying he couldn't remember which one of us had the birthday first, so he was wishing it to both of us. M Mike remembered, he just didn't want to send two emails. As you saw on the screen, our most important connection was through the Writers Guild West. In 2007, when I was president, John was negotiating committee chair. Together, we led the 100-day strike over new media, what we now call streaming. Many of the announcements and very stressful moments happening in this very room. Um, John was specifically tasked with handling showrunners and A-list screenwriters, a smart, clever, determined, and even surly lot of characters who John wrangled with grace and good nature. Being a smart, clever, determined, and even surly character himself. Throughout the strike, John was our rock. Sometimes we stood on him. Sometimes we threw him. Sometimes we dropped him on people. I've always said that the strike was the hardest thing I ever did. Dealing with the loss of John has challenged that, uh, that title. But through it all, John's wise words still ring true. Yeah, but you had fun. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce a series of speakers. Our first is Matt Wickline, who met John in 1990 at In Living Color and over the years since became great friends and worked together on shows like Martin and the Hughleys as well as creating pilots and shows together, including Frank TV and Cedric the Entertainer Presents. Matt and his family are also Catholic and attend the same church as John and Shannon in Santa Monica. So Matt would like to do a special epistle reading on John's behalf, Matt Wickline. A reading from the first letter of John to the scribes. Take heart and be glad, for though I am no longer among you, I am surely always with you, in spirit, in memory, and in the mm -hmm. ironclad language of the 2011 MBA contract covering future streaming video and, and on-demand residuals. My brothers and sisters, rejoice. We fought the good fight and won. I was with you then, I am with you now in myriad ways. I am with you in the laughter of children as they find jokes on 30-year-old Martin reruns, refreshing and new. But mostly they love how Shanene just crazy. I am also with you at morning table reads where Emmy dreams are dashed by the cold reading of your script by a hungover star wearing sunglasses, or a sketch performer deciding your material would really kill if spoken Senior Wentz's style out of his talking butthole. <laughs> and I am with you in the locked room on the upper floor where a script rewrite drags on and on because too many of the writers you hired are stand-ups <laughs> who are single without families <laughs> and have nowhere better to be. <laughs> and I am with you in that same room after midnight when those stand-ups are the only people awake and still pitching May God bless them and forgive me for that previous joke at their expense. I am also beside you at the craft service table where that third apple fritter cannot possibly fill the gaping hole in your soul <laughs> caused by endless contradictory network notes, but also where the resulting sugar rush and that galling note 
must regrettably be credited, credited for producing the best joke you ever wrote. But take heed and never admit this secret to those minions of the Dark Lord who will surely persecute you with double notes tomorrow for your good works today. And take heart too, for I can testify with certainty that in a very hot place in the ninth ring of hell await your former tormentors, the repeated jabbing with a pitchfork, pitchfork by a bitter and rotting demon with the head of a magpie. Brethren, though pearls of your best work suffer the crickets chirp, the censor's exclusion, or the entertainment weekly critics stale scorn, fear not, for I am always, always with you. And be assured that you are all likewise in my heart forever. From the thousands of laughs we created and the millions of laughs we shared. On stage floors and in writers' rooms, at restaurants and at each other's homes, at the guild offices and on those strike lines. My one life was filled with enough joy for 100 lives. Your wit, craft, creativity, love, and especially friendship filled my heart so full that it could not die. And I'm here to tell you that it does not die. This joy we make and share indeed lives forever. Which is why accepting anything less than 1.2% of distributors gross on internet downloads <laughs> would have been an abomination. May the Lord bless you and keep you and rain green envelopes upon you. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> and now to begin a steady stream of former presidents of Harvard stuff. Our next speaker is former Harvard Lampoon President Dan Graney, who will be reading a message from former Lampoon President George Meyer. George asked me to speak on his behalf because he can't be here. And I was very honored to accept because I love George and John and got to know John uh, particularly well in the final illness of our dear friend, Kevin Curran, and then in the preparations for his funeral. And uh, one of the nice things about today, besides speaking the words of George, is that I'm not having to follow John. <laughs> so now the rest is George's. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but there's only one furry con and it's in Reno. John was, my, John was my dear friend and my Catholic rabbi. He was a man of character, so strong and stalwart that he truly inspired me to feel worse about myself. He loved to laugh, and he loved to make you laugh. When I heard the cruel news that John was gone, it didn't seem possible. Honestly, I had not felt that shaken up since I saw that picture of Dennis Rodman wearing a wedding dress. John was the only friend that I'd regularly see soaked in sweat. John. You're soaked in sweat, I'd say. Yeah, I just went for a little run. One time I accompanied him on a little run in the Santa Monica Mountains. The next day I had to get new feet. I'll remember John as an affable and patient fellow. You could call him at 10 p.m. to ask him about the latest Writers Guild negotiations, and he would give you the lowdown as if he hadn't already done that a dozen times that day. Endearingly, he would refer to the other side as bastards and pricks. <laughs> I live in Seattle because of John. In the spring of 95, John, Jim Downey, and I visited the city to see the Final Four. John organized the whole Charmed Weekend, and I flipped for the place. We ran into Celtics great Bill Russell, just hanging around on the steps of the Seattle Kingdom, and John struck up a conversation. Later, we wandered along the waterfront, finally stopping at a nondescript joint called the OK Hotel. It turned out to be the dive bar where Nirvana first played Smells Like Teen Spirit. Good things happen when you were with JFP. For a writer, he was good looking. For a comedy writer, he was mouthwatering. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, George. Uh, even better, he embodied the Harvard Lampoon ethos, which is that life is ridiculous and insulting, but you still have to hurl yourself into it. John was deeply proud of his children and even prouder of the Packers. He was, a thoroughly, devoted, he was thoroughly devoted to his wife, Shannon, and I'll always treasure the boisterous parties they hosted at their home. Food was thrown. Art was damaged, but somehow people always got hurt too. <laughs> John was a jovial soul who delighted in human beings and served them in a hundred ways. I miss him daily, his wit, 
his boyish smile, and his laugh that drove the clouds away. And another former Harvard Lampoon president, Jeff Martin, reading texts of a former Harvard Lampoon president, Jim Downey, with someone graced with a much better title, John's actual son, Nikki Bowman. Testing. Okay. Do you want that, Mike? Mm -hmm. My mom and dad met their friend Jim Downey in 1981 before they were married, and they instantly became close. Later, they wrote together at Saturday Night Live, but even after my parents moved to LA, they stayed in touch, my mom via phone, my dad mostly by text. According to Jim, my dad's texts were his favorite reading material and represented John at his most John Bowmaniest. Very intelligent, very, very silly, and above all, resolutely deadpan. John Bowman would never, ever, under any circumstances, admit that he was, quote, just kidding. My dad and Jim share an extensive texting history going back more than a dozen years, which is unfortunately, for now at least, locked away on John's cell phone. But Jim, who could not be here today because of a family obligation back east, uh, sent along what he has beginning in 2018 after he dropped his cell phone and had to get a new one. Another lifelong friend of my dad, Jeff Martin, has agreed to read Jim's text and I will read my dad's. The earliest surviving text exchange concerns Sister Jean Schmidt, the 98-year-old nun who served as chaplain of the Loyola Ramblers, the men's basketball team of the Loyola University of Chicago, and who was a media star during the 2018 NCAA tournament. My dad and Jim became convinced that Sister Jean's much-reported $2 bets on the tournament games were most likely cover for a severe gambling addiction, <laughs> including wagering on the trial of Jesus by Pontius Pilate. <laughs> Sister Jean tells me this Holy Week, Pilot looks like a winner. We'll see. Heard Sister Jean was in Vegas doubling her bet on Michigan to cover Nevada losses. Not right. Truly one of the most loathsome creatures the world of collegiate sports has ever seen. She reminds me of OJ minus the feel good end. Bingo. Sister Jean just now on TV. The Ramblers, I guess I hope they win. But how do you like my new habit? All about her. Worse than Hitler, I would say, pound for pound, yes. I thought Wushok was the most grotesque mascot in America until I met Sister Jean. At least Wushok believes in wheat. What does Sister Jean believe in? Not the Ramblers, not God. Later that year, while texting during a Milwaukee Brewers playoff game, my dad revealed to Jim that he was actually in Buffalo, New York, and the real purpose of his visit there. In Buffalo, on the trail of McKinley's murderer. Could use some help, buddy. Johnny, stand down. Some very important people don't want this looked into. Johnny, stand down. Leon Cholgos was duly tried, convicted, and executed for the crime. We are confident that he acted alone, and there the matter should rest. All evidence in the case has been destroyed in the interest of finality. I am telling you, John, stand down. You are way out of line. I'm turning up some uncomfortable truths on Google. Turns out Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to gain if McKinley died. Johnny, if you don't stand down, I can't protect you. Just Google Taft. What a fat fuck. No way he killed anyone. Don't focus on Taft. Taft is the distraction. It's Cleveland. It was always Cleveland. Really? Tell that to Philander C. Knox, whom Taft elevated to Secretary of State. Where'd he come from? Nowhere. Exactly nowhere. Johnny, can't you figure it out? The Jim Taylor death this morning was the last warning you're going to get. I don't care who they kill. Taylor, Lombardi, Robert Cal Hubbard, 
These men were warriors all, and they died, so name redacted, who told me some shit about James Polk could be heard. <laughs> a few days later, Jim was trying to impress his son's friends by claiming that he had invented the phrase, tie goes to the runner, and my dad agreed to help. Dear friend of Jim Downey, I have something that's very important to me. In the months ahead, it is my intention to mount an aggressive PR campaign to inform or remind uh, the people of this nation that I am the inventor of the phrase, tie goes to the runner. Any help you can provide here will be greatly appreciated. Yours, James Downey. Yesterday, when my blood sugar was low and I had to have something to eat, you pointed out that I probably wouldn't get my or wouldn't get the press I wanted without filling in more details. I see that now. I think we can both help each other get our stories out there. I don't use Twitter or Facebook or have many friends, but the girl at CBS is going to get an earful today about that tie business. Thanks, man. Last night watching the games, I twice heard the announcer use my phrase, tie goes to the runner, and I have to tell you, it's a pretty good feeling. I invented tie goes to the catcher, but because it didn't conform to the rules, it never caught on. Everything's luck and timing. Johnny, I'm sitting here wargaming a possible scenario where some clown comes forward claiming to have film slash audio slash journalistic evidence that the phrase was in use before my known year of birth, 1952. Possible responses. A, ignore him, refuse to engage, and it goes away. B, my preference. Total all-out campaign of personal vilification, utterly. Destroy the reputation and credibility of the critic. Everything about him or her, and I mean everything, would be fair game. Baseball lore is a racket, man. I wrote the second verse to take me out to the ball game, but because it was exactly the same as the first verse, I never get credit. <laughs> Let's tear the lid off this motherfucker. My dad's death was unexpected for everyone, including himself. So his last words to his friends and family were not somber proclamations of love, but instead little notes that only someone who loves you could write. My last text from him was just a link to great restaurants in San Antonio where I'm getting married. None of you are invited. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the last text from my dad to Jim was dated December 27, 2021, sent the day before his death because he heard his friend was sick. Mucinex DM, two pills in the morning, two at night before bed. Alka-Seltzer cold and flu, daytime, every three hours. The important thing is to keep the chest wheeze at bay. DM does that, but if it hits, get a five-day Z-pack right away. This ain't no joke. Thank you. Well, thanks, Nikki, and, and also thanks to you and Johnny for uh, putting that slideshow together. That was great. So, um, having spoken at length at uh, John's funeral, uh, my feelings about him are on record, but uh, I'm grateful for the chance, chance to touch on just a few extra things. Uh, one that's appropriate uh, for this event is uh, Bowman the writer. I think uh, John's abilities as a wordsmith were evident in the, the text we just read. It, it was already there way back in his pre-professional days uh, on the Lampoon. And now, truth be told, most Harvard Lampoon articles aren't very funny, but uh, John's were an exception. That, that cheerful, wise guy confidence that made him such an entertaining character in person came right through on the page. Uh, one example, his last piece, published just after he graduated, was a, a screed telling Harvard professors exactly what he thought of them with the ominous title, Now It's My Turn. <laughs> now, Bowman the showrunner, uh, I only got to experience up close once on a sitcom about uh, 25 years ago. And uh, like Lampoon articles, I think it's fair to say most sitcoms aren't perfect. Uh, if that offends anyone here, we can take it up later outside, but, but 
That's my opinion. Uh, anyway, it was clear early on that, that this show wasn't going to work. And uh, of course, that, that can be a tense situation. But John was such a fun and kind boss that we all had a great time as we spiraled down the drain. Uh, the, the sharpest thing I can remember him saying to me is, uh, oh, pal, you're not going to say that again. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, today, I want to stick to the time limit. So just, just one more memory. Uh, myself and others have talked a lot how, particularly in college, uh, John always seemed like a man from another time. Uh, he had an old-fashioned Irish Catholic sensibility. Uh, he'd enjoy hitting you with an ancient insult like uh, tall, dark, and gruesome. Uh, and his favorite singer appeared to be Tex Beneke of the Glenn Miller Orchestra. I remember John would swagger around singing, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I got a gal from Kalamazoo. So uh, on paper, you could have made the argument that, that uh, he was the most unhip man in Cambridge. And yet his signature greeting when entering a room was, hey, squares. <laughs> and the really amazing part is he pulled it off. Uh, in, in that moment, you believe that this square-jawed guy in khakis and loafers with, with a head full of hair gel had it all wired. And, and you loved him for deigning to come down from Mount Cool and hang out with you. And who else could do that? No one. And it's, it's just another reason no one will ever take John's place. Uh, he was magic. Okay, so you're all tired of the lampoon, so we have somebody uh, next who, uh, he did go to Harvard, and, uh, but he comped, I think, three times, was not elected. He's here via video clip because he happens to have been a United States Senator. Here's a clip from Al Franken. Well, uh, John and, and, and Chen came to the show, and, uh, you know, John, uh, the sweetest guy, uh, Shannon, very nice, nice too. Uh, and I think I share with pretty much everyone there that John would be the last person you would imagine this would happen to with a heart thing because uh, he was in a great shape, exercised. Uh, all the time, I remember sometimes we'd stay up all night and didn't, he didn't get much, uh, any sleep and he'd go to the gym because he'd say that exercise makes up for not sleeping. And uh, ate great, but mainly uh, the not conflicted in the least, sweetest, most wonderful, nicest guy who went through uh, the world incredibly happy and also funny. I can't get up the stairs without the light, otherwise <laughs> we're gonna have physical comedy. So uh, it's clear John was a Harvard spouse, alum and parent once twice and thrice over. Here is a former president of the Harvard Alumni Association and classmate of John's, Cynthia Torres. My long friendship with John started in college. Uh, I met him early during our freshman year um, when all of us were milling around, happily introducing ourselves. John came right up, told me he was from Wisconsin and started talking with me about football and I just stared at him. Um, <laughs> uh, and I was really struck by that. I just thought he's such a natural, genuine, happy guy. And I love that he decided to share 
something that he also just felt so great about. I saw John during college in the years that followed in the way the classmates do, uh, running across the street in the rain, uh, bumping into each other, crossing Harvard Yard, and seeing him at events on campus. I saw John many years later after college graduation. I saw John and Shannon actually socially quite a bit after we settled in Santa Monica uh, to raise our families. I became the president of the Harvard Club of Southern California in 2006. And at some point while I was president, I recruited John onto the board of the Harvard Club of Southern California, where he served as the club's vice president of communications. And I got to know him better still when he became an elected director of the Harvard Alumni Association in 2012. What I noted about John, and has been described so very well by other people today, is how easily John makes friends. Uh, he would just bound into a room, give that, give that brilliant smile, and with the most gracious way, start meeting people, really interested in them very eager to know what, what they're about, and very eager to share who he was. And that made him enormously popular with people in the Harvard Alumni Association. They wanted to know very much who he was and were very um, curious about Hollywood. And he shared a world that to so many was so very different from the lives that they lived. And that was fantastic. Um, people were, were so glad to get to know him. After John was elected to the Alumni Association's Executive Committee in 2016, I was asked to serve as his mentor. Well, John loved that idea. He got very excited, um, and he invited me out for lunch so that we could really talk a lot about what made that Harvard Alumni Association board tick and how he could contribute to it. And during that lunch conversation, somehow our, our conversation topics broadened to our Catholicism, to how passionately we, we felt about our families, to about how, how devoted we were to our college alumni community. And it was during that conversation that we really connected. So John and I then had lunch or Zoomed, uh, I would say, you know, pretty often then over the next six years, at least once a month, maybe a lot more. And our topics often started with Harvard, but then always went beyond that, way beyond that, to talk about things that we cared about, including, again, our families, but also the state of the nation. And I was always so impressed with John's amazing emotional intuition about people and his strong moral compass. Last September, John invited my boyfriend Tom and I to join him at a Dodger game in John's great seats. We enjoyed a fantastic experience. This was the game where pitcher Max Scherzer scored his 3,000th strikeout. John was in his element at that game, laughing and clapping and cheering on the home team. After John passed away unexpectedly last December, it fell to me to notify all of the people who John had worked with at the Harvard Alumni Association my inbox was deluged immediately with dozens of beautiful messages from alumni association directors all over the world and from senior Harvard staff people who John had also touched. I have shared those messages with Shannon and the kids and I'd like to share a couple of those with you now. From Vanessa Liu, this year's Harvard Alumni Association president wrote, I am so incredibly saddened to hear this news John was one of the first people I met during my first elected director's meeting, and I was instantly taken by his humor and kindness. Sending you all a collective hug as we have lost such an incredible member of our community. From Marty Grasso, a former president of the Harvard Alumni Association, quote, this is stunning news that I'm having a difficult time assimilating. We have lost a fine human being who is always in the moment and loved being fully engaged with our community. My only comfort is that during my last exchange with John, he was beaming with pride and delight over the successful and joyous wedding of his daughter, Courtney, after having it postponed for a year due to the pandemic." Unquote. As my longtime friend, I know that John especially treasured his family. 
He told an interviewer for Socolo Public Square in 2017 that he wanted to be remembered as a man who loved his family. He said, if I want to be remembered in any way, it's as a good dad and a good husband. I just love that. John talked in about every conversation that I had with him about his love for his family and his gratitude for his many blessings. And I know that my life has been so very greatly enriched because I have known John Bowman. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the last of many John Bowman alumni, Harvard alumni appointments was to the uh, uh, the vice presidency of Harvard Wood, which is the portmanteau for Harvard alumni in Hollywood. Here is the co-founder, and I assume former president of Harvard Wood, <laughs> Mia Riverton Albert. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, we are transitioning to a benevolent dictatorship, so you'll all get the memo shortly. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I also appreciate you not scheduling me after the comedy writers. Muchas gracias. So I first met John Bowman in the early aughts, a few years after I had graduated from college and moved to Los Angeles. We met at a reception at our mutual friend Lisa's house uh, as part of the festivities for an alumni entertainment symposium that I had helped to organize. Being a relative newcomer, I didn't know many people, possibly any people at the party, but John greeted me with that big movie star smile and his booming voice with a warm hello and proceeded to introduce himself and Shannon. We were in a room full of his friends, industry luminaries, one and all, and he probably spent a good half an hour talking to me, a recent college grad with little to no social standing, about myself, my aspirations, and Harvardwood, the arts organization that I had recently co-founded. John's genuine enthusiasm and interest, I would later come to find, carried through all aspects of his life and was representative of his deep curiosity and ability to engage authentically uh, with anyone and anything, especially football, of course. In the years that followed, John became a mentor and a friend supporting me personally and Harvard Wood as well in myriad ways. I looked up to him as a role model for how to lead a balanced life. He was, of course, a creative dynamo and natural born leader with a great jawline and many accolades and achievements during his career. But whenever our paths cross, he spoke of his family, often and adoringly, clearly reveling his role as husband and father most of all. John's life was, as you all know, incredibly, wonderfully full. And nevertheless, he always found time to lend a helping hand, share words of advice, make an introduction, or open up his and Shannon's beautiful home to foster community building with a side of the occasional drunken carousing. Not long before the pandemic hit, in fact, John and Shannon were once again our gracious hosts for a celebration of our public service program uh, grant recipients. Ever the gifted wordsmith, John moved me to tears with his eloquent and extemporaneous remarks. He talked, as he so often did, about the power of community and the importance of the arts and artists. And when thanked for his own role, roles really in, in this regard, he deflected and reflected those compliments back to others with typical modesty. It's clear to anyone who knew John that he had a tremendous heart for service, teaching, and mentorship. Indeed, at his funeral reception in January, Shannon sought me out specifically to tell me about a recent graduate that John had just started to take under his wing. And she said with great clarity that John would want to make sure that this young person had some support as he started his journey in Hollywood. And so he will. Just one more example of John's kindness and how his generous spirit and devotion to giving back will live on. The immensely positive impact he made on myself and so many others in too short a time will reverberate in the years to come as we all try to live up to his example and hold him fast in our hearts. That great man, mentor, and mensch, John Bowman. Thank you. mentioned that John and I both married lampoon spouses. You've heard from his. Here's mine, Maya Williams. Hi. 
Hello, everyone. Um, so as you've already heard, if, if you knew John at all, you knew he was a great mentor. Uh, it was something he loved doing. It was what he did as a showrunner, and it's what he did as a lecturer at USC, guiding young people, showing them how to harness their creativity and tell their stories. And though I was not a student of John's, he was in many ways a mentor for me, not in my writing career, but in leadership. So I first met John uh, through Shannon uh, on the Lampoon. Shannon was a senior and I was a freshman and I was terrified of her. Um, so uh, John uh, had already graduated, so I only met him in passing and I was terrified of him too. But over time, I got to know him a little better uh, as we traveled in the same circles and my terror dissipated. Uh, but I mainly interacted uh, with him through proximity to my husband, Patrick Verone, uh, who was John's contemporary and knew him much better than I did. Honestly, I figured John just thought I was uh, the person that Patrick showed up with at parties. So I was a little bit surprised when he called me to accept an invitation to join the Harvard Lampoon's Board of Trustees. I was frankly honored just to know that I was on his radar. Uh, what does it entail, I said. Well, you have two in-person meetings a year in Cambridge. You pay for your own travel and hotel. You have to support the Lampoon with a sizable donation and wrangle Harvard undergrads who will ignore you and defy you. <laughs> Sign me up, I said. <laughs> I must admit that part of why I agreed so readily was because I thought it would be fun to suffer all of those things with John. But alas, our terms as trustees overlapped by only one meeting and it was a meeting he didn't even attend. But, uh, but then it happened again. Two years later, John called me and said he was going to nominate me uh, for the Harvard Alumni Association Board of Directors. Again, I was surprised and honored that he was thinking of me at all. What does it entail, I asked. Well, it's a three in-person meetings uh, a year in Cambridge. You pay for your own travel and hotel. Uh, you'll have to spend a day and a half trying to figure out ways to engage alumni and then spend the rest of the year applying these ideas. And all of this is guaranteed to suck up all of your spare time. Sign me up, I said again, because I was beginning to realize just what it was that John saw in me. He saw a masochist, a glutton for punishment. Or maybe he just saw a big sucker, you know. Uh, or maybe he saw someone who shared some of his same characteristics, I hoped. Um, the ones I so admired, like his open and easygoing spirit his ability to engage with people, his power of persuasion, and his propensity for tackling problems and finding solutions. Again, I said yes, imagining how fun it would be to do all those tedious Harvard alumni things with John, that he would be my mentor, but that wasn't in the cards either. There is one other time when John recommended me for something, but this time I initiated it. Last summer, I decided I want to go back to school uh, to get a master's degree in African American studies at UCLA. The application process was rough, so I had to take the GRE, produce a current academic writing sample, dig up one of my Harvard professors for a letter of recommendation, not easy to find one that was still alive. <laughs> but the easiest part of the process was asking John to write a letter on my behalf. I emailed him with my request, and within two minutes, he emailed me back. This is fantastic, he said, I'm in. So happily I was accepted, but once again, I was unable to share even this news with John. In this whole process, however, I was left with a, a gift. At the end of November, before John turned it in, he sent me the letter of recommendation that he planned to submit. So now I know exactly what John thought of me. It's the last communication that I had with him and it's, it's beautiful. It's filled with wild exaggerations, but, but it's very beautiful. So I tell you these stories, not just to brag that John thought I was awesome, but to stand here as an example of some, someone whose life he touched in a meaningful and permanent way. John was looking out for me. He sought to place me in positions of leadership that I hadn't ever considered for myself. And he made me believe that not only did I belong in those positions, but that I would thrive there. He gave me the confidence to say yes. And as I continue with the work that he lured me into, I have him always in mind, trying to follow his example, trying to live up to what he said in that letter. I guess in that way, John is still my mentor. So thanks, John. Thanks for the faith you had in me. Thanks for the encouragement. Thanks for pushing me to be engaged, 
to be and bring my best self. And I'm not alone in my gratitude. You made a difference, not just in my life, but in countless others. Thank you. Were you terrified of me too? <laughs> I seem to remember that you were. All right, enough about Harvard. Our next uh, speakers will focus on John's time at USC. Um, our first is a fellow former president of the Writers Guild of America West, Howard A. Rodman. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you all for tolerating a speaker from one of the lesser Ivies. <laughs> I knew John through the Guild, where, as you know, he chaired our most important negotiating committee ever. And I knew him through USC, where he taught, and my colleague David Isaacs, who will follow me, will speak more about that. Um, there are so many of us here to celebrate John. And so I'm going to be brief. I'm going to just say seven things about him. First, um, John could have very easily coasted in a white collar job. Instead, he ran away and joined the circus. This does not say much for his sanity, but does say a lot for his courage. He rocked a blue blazer better than anyone in the guild, east or west. <laughs> he looked so much like a regular person but then he opened his mouth and he was a writer. In negotiations, this confused them. <laughs> Has anyone here written for any of the streaming services? I'm talking about what was then called new media, but which is now just called the world. If you get paid for your work, if you've ever gotten a residual for that work, your thanks are in large part due to John. Fun fact, the company said there was no future in it, no viable business model, Yet strangely, they didn't want to give it up. We made them. The notion that in the future, writers will be able to get paid for their writing was not something that was guaranteed, but exists now. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, fellow writers. And thank you, John. I'd like now to pay John the highest compliment that I think you can pay anyone in the entertainment industry. I knew him for an entire year before he let drop where he went to college. <laughs> John also had the capacity to deliver a wry, wicked insult, but I never heard him use it against anyone who didn't deserve it. <laughs> John convened and united a community of writers. He understood there is nothing more necessary and nothing more powerful. And far more, he made us understand it. Seven, I cannot recall a conversation with John in which he did not speak of his family. His generosity of spirit started from home and spread out from there. John set an example of quiet integrity to challenge us to be better, to reassure us of our strength. To those of us, and there are so many of us who were in one way or another part of John's elective family, thank you to his most treasured family, the one at home, for sharing him during his time with us. All too brief. All too brief. I'm here to talk further about John at USC one of the great television comedy writers of all time, which I can say because he didn't give me a joke introduction, David Isaacs. Thank you, Patrick, for the ultimate disappointment of that introduction. Um, uh, my uh, friendship with and working relationship with John began a bit uh, later than most of you. I, I didn't attend Harvard or work on the Lampoon. I graduated from the University of Miami at a time when you could still get a, a degree in paramutual sports wagering with an emphasis in high life. Uh, don't laugh, uh, the, the late Daily Double got me out here. Um, like John, I worked um, most of my career in half hours in, in sitcoms, but never 
unluckily for me, never with or for John. Our paths, our paths crossed uh, for the first time early in the last decade in, at USC in the School of Cinematic Arts when John came aboard as an adjunct instructor in screen and TV writing. And I can, tell, I can tell you that as a teacher, he was a perfect fit, mainly through the positivity he naturally brought to the classroom, which was there in his affability, his optimism, and his ease in handling any, situ any situation, any challenge he faced without doubt or complaint. You know, the, the Gentile stuff. Um, he became a great addition to our faculty and a cherished mentor to our uh, student cohorts, um, and that is evidenced by the many students have reached out, I think, to the family and to us, um, and the num a number of John's writing students that are here today. Uh, John was also uh, invaluable to a program my SCA colleagues, uh, Barnett Kelman and Jack's, Jack Epps and I created right before John arrived. It was our idea that we should create a curriculum that would allow young writers to develop their comic voice at the college level. We were inspired, of course, by the connection of Harvard to, uh, uh, Harvard to comedy through the, the, the lampoon. Um, trouble is, we did not have someone with a range of comedy writing work that John possessed, sketch, monologue, sitcom, all in one great package. Uh, in his time with us, John not only taught all our sitcom courses, but um, helped create and write the syllabus for a course in writing for late night and supervised the writing of USC Comedy Live, which mimicked the experience of writing and performing and broadcasting SNL. It goes out on Trojan Vision, which is available to over 2 million homes in LA. Coincidentally, that is the exact number of people who don't watch Trojan Vision. <laughs> but uh, it's the experience that counts. Um, we also knew each other, strangely enough, I can speak to John's uh, workout acumen. Uh, I found out we were both members of the uh, Jonathan Club. My wife is the member, John was the member I get to go. Uh, and he, it, the, the contrast, of course, is amazing because John could be, have been the poster boy for the club and I'm, my name down there is Mr. There Must Be Some Mistake. Um, <laughs> but on a personal note, John uh, helped me uh, in a class I taught called Foundations of Comedy. Who better to teach her? Uh, the highlight of that class for me, and I know for the over 100 students every semester, was a visit in the fourth week from Professor John Bowman to discuss the actual nuts and bolts of joke writing, which would turn into a great icebreaker when he handed out the uh, copies of the Daily Trojan and, had student, and st students had to uh, use the Bowman formula to write jokes from the headlines. And just like that, you know, four weeks of trying to crack uh, the hardest cases of rest, resting bitch face from the students ended in success. On, uh, on the final, and this is somewhat of a legacy for me, on the final, I would add an extra credit question based on John's writing, joke writing formula, which I call the Bowman bonus. I would also call it the John Bowman gift endowment, because while a few students taking the final were pretty sure that Preston Sturgis was married to Lucille Ball and had invented uh, multicam comedy, no one ever missed the Bowman bonus. Um, on behalf of the School of Cinematic Arts of students and faculty, um, thank you, Shannon, and the family for um, sharing John with us. And now back to Harvard. Um, the last of our Lampoon, former Lampoon presidents, uh, was the first female Lampoon president and fellow Lampoon trustee with John Lisa Henson. I know you want more Harvard Lampoon. <laughs> um, uh, father, uh, brother, husband, boss, mentor, leader. You know, we're all trying to figure out how to do things right and good throughout our lives. What's the right way to do things? What's worth doing? What's right? And John actually had so much of that figured out. And that's why um, he'll always be a guide and a mentor to me. Um, 
Now that we're older, a few years doesn't make that much difference. But in college, those two to three years are critical. And you feel like you'll never be on that upperclassman's level. Um, I wasn't really scared of him, but I didn't feel like a full peer of John's until I had the chance to serve with him on the trustees of the Lampoon. I felt so honored um, to be with him. And when you hear the word trustee, you might first think about a, um, an ancient mummy like old Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. But you also might think of an archetypal John Bowman type, a youngish elder statesman who's congenial, appropriate, kind, and authoritative, someone who rocks a tuxedo like nobody else. Um, but unlike some of the other Lampoon grads, um, John didn't think that it was like some unrelated good luck or just pure talent that landed him in Hollywood. He really knew the importance of the Lampoon friendships and the community, and he wanted to give back. He signed up to be a trustee at a time when it was considered a lifetime appointment or a life sentence, depending on your point of view. And he put in endless hours organizing important events like the 100th anniversary of the Lampoon Castle, which took place in 2009. So most of you have seen the castle. Many of you have spent the best days of your lives there. Others may only be annoyed by the idea of it. But the castle is actually amazing. It, the, if you haven't seen it, it's a miniature Flemish style building built by William Randolph Hearst. And it needs a lot of love and upkeep and fundraising to take care of it. And according to Eric Raymond, because I wasn't able to attend this event, John volunteered to take on that castle project, that castle event. And he really was a creative showrunner. He took a plain old hotel ballroom at the Charles Hotel and transformed it and lampoonified the space with long rows of tables with sconces and blown up lampoon posters on the walls. There were speeches by Conan O'Brien, Dave Mandel, and many more. Jim Downey showed a slideshow of a polar bear doing lewd acts in the castle. And when dinner was over, the guests were told to remove the sconces from the table and to parade to the castle, along with a jester on a white horse, a hot air balloon in the shape of John P. Marquand Jr., the great rotund former faculty friend of the Lampoon, the Harvard marching band, jugglers, and koto drummers. The group processed to the castle, which was lit up by lasers and a fireworks display. Great producing. You don't get to do that at USC or the w WGA. In managing the students, John always worked to maintain the Lampoon as a comedy organization first and a club second. He was a careful watchdog against any form of hazing or abuse. And he always talked about how the Lampoon could best welcome and dignify new members. He really didn't like conflict with the, with the kids. And while other trustees would go ballistic and get, <laughs> and get mired in frustration. John remained calm, reasonable, open to compromise. And when kids didn't take his advice, he took it in stride like a good parent. They're not bad, he'd say, they're, they're good kids. And I love the way that John said that people were good. Like he said my husband was a good man and he told me that I was a good artist. And his appro approval was so sincere, it was like a pat on the shoulder. After 15 years as a trustee, John finally rolled off and we had a big Bowman family dinner at the castle honoring John, Shannon, and their two Lampoon kids, Courtney and Alec, and everybody else came as a kind of first family of the Lampoon. And at that dinner, John was so gracious and he went around the room saying nice, kind things about everybody else, ever the most generous person. Once when I was invited to, once when I was there before one of our trustees meetings on a Sunday morning, um, John and Ted Winwer invited me to go to church with them early Sunday morning. And since it hasn't been mentioned here, I just wanted to say that John went to church every day, just about. And I never met anybody like that in my life. Um, it was really early for me with the West Coast jet lag. And as the service proceeded though, I fell into a more and more comfortable and peaceful state of mind as John was beside me. And as authoritative as he was, he was so humble before God. I felt at that moment like a child with a big brother. So 
And we, we all struggle our whole lives with the big questions of how to do things right, what's good. And John really did know how to do things right. And I know he thought so highly of so many people here. And if you said you were good, you're good. Thanks. One more former president of a Harvard thing, <laughs> making a special presentation on behalf of the Harvard Club of Southern California, California, its former president, George Newhouse. It's a pleasure to be here. Patrick, of course, exhorted me before indicating that I would have, what, two or three minutes to speak, Patrick? Three minutes. Uh, but I am a, <laughs> but I'm a lawyer, so that's probably not going to happen, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Harvard Club of Southern California. Um, probably more than half of the people here are former presidents of that club, including Cynthia Torres. And uh, so we, of course, knew John for only a couple years on our board when he went on to bigger and better things. Um, but I'm, I'm here to award him uh, the highest honor that the club can bestow on a former member. And that is the Fred Smith Award for exemplary service to the club and the university. And I'd like to say a couple words about Fred Smith so you can appreciate those of you who are obviously into comedy, um, the great irony of, of John getting the, the Fred Smith Award. Fred Smith, like John, loved Harvard. Um, unlike John, he was on the Harvard board for 30 years. He never missed a meeting, never failed to object to the minutes when they were presented. <laughs> and Fred and John share the quality that they were devoted to their commitment to the university and doing the right thing. John, as we know from this presentation we all knew before, uh, was a man of humor. He was a funny man. Um, and he uh, charmed everyone, including not, as, not especially, especially Harvard University, with his wit and his charm, um, and he profited and, and benefited others with that. Fred Smith, on the other hand, was not a funny man. He brought, to the, he brought seriousness and he brought hard work, but he brought uh, the kind of humor to the board that a tax lawyer would provide. But he was a good man, and, and, and he was so treasured and so revered that we came up with this award to be given to someone every year who exemplifies the service to the community and to the club. Now, Cynthia has done, as she always does, um, an excellent job um, with my uh, stepping over my introduction. So she has mentioned, and we all know, about some of John's highlights in the service to Harvard. Um, and I'm only going to repeat these things two or three times. I'd, I'd like to get to the point and get off one in minute. <laughs> one minute left. <laughs> the only thing I would like to add, of course, that wasn't mentioned was John literally did a decade of service. He was an elected director. Um, and then after you're elected director, usually you cycle off. But John was obviously a force, a force that was appreciated by the university. So they asked him to stay on on the executive committee. And then after that, he did that in 2019, he went on the nominating committee. Uh, and the nominating committee is a, actually an important job at Harvard because the, these are the folks who select the HAA board of directors and also the, 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 the overseers. So I should say select the candidates for the election um, which uh, is then presented to the university um, alumni. Um, and I have no doubt, had he been able to complete that service, given his current trajectory, I think Cynthia would agree with me, um, John Bowman undoubtedly would have been one of the next presidents of the Harvard Alumni Association. They would have asked him to run, and he would have, as he always did, charmed everybody. So um, it's... It's my honor at this point, if Shannon can come up, I would like to present um, to her as John's representative and to the family, um, the Harvard Club of Southern California Fred Smith Award for Outstanding Service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, much. so let me, again, it just says, the Harvard Club of Southern California presents the Fred Smith Award for Outstanding Service to John Bowman, June 12, 2022. And we all love John, the university loved John, and we're so happy to give this 
exemplar of our gratitude and respect to the family. Thank you. I'm going to tell you, uh, this is going to go in our home right next to John's Emmy because this part, wow. this part of his life was just as important. Thank you. Our final speaker tonight changed his plans to be here, his plans to drop off his daughter at math camp. And if you know him, you know how on brand that is. Another of John and my fellow initiates, the Lampoon in 1978, Al Jean. Um. I just wanted to say, uh, I know I'm the last speaker and I'm sure Patrick has prepared a fabulous meal outside, so I'm going to be very, very, very long. <laughs> 1957 was a great year for Milwaukee. The Braves won the World Series. A uh, second good thing happened, I can't find it. But the <laughs> third thing was, John Frederick Bowman was born September 28th joining brothers Bill, Jim, Tom, Joe, and Sister Sue in what was known then as a tiny Catholic family. <laughs> John and I have been friends since I was 17. I visited him and his family where he took me to a magical place called the Miller Brewing Company, where they let us drink as many free beers as we wanted and then drive home alone. That was my Woodstock. Flash forward to 1982, when John made a beautiful life choice that would bring him only happiness, dumping Andy Borowitz. <laughs> he told me he was planning to renew that vow. John also married that year, and he and Shannon soon had the blessing from God they'd always wanted, Emmys. I I'm just kidding. They actually got something much more meaningful, membership in the Writers Guild. Soon I worked with John on the Gary Shandling show, which was challenging for him because John didn't yet how to know how to write for white actors. But we became very close. He was my best man and there was no better. Last year I was very lucky to go with him to several ball games. And of course we always talk by text, as people have mentioned. Sometimes we texted about his close Harvard Business School friend, Steve Bannon. That's not a joke. <laughs> How I wish I had a chance to text back and forth with John about sports or politics or anything just one last time. I'll mention one more text. I once told John the nickname for pitcher Christy Mathewson was true, was the Christian gentleman. John texted back, Christian gentlemen will never be taught by those who value kindness and decency. I just tried to think of a better adjective noun combination and it doesn't exist. By that definition, no one deserves the nickname Christian gentleman more than John Bowman. Yeah, I was cooking all morning, so there should be something out there. Um, before we adjourn to the reception in the lobby, I just want to thank a few people publicly. The officers, the current officers of the Writers Guild, uh, Meredith Steam, Michelle Mulroney, and Betsy Thomas, who not only uh, offered this space and covered the cost of the catering, they even picked up the tab for your parking. Um, so thank you to them, also to the staff of the Guild and the Guild Theater, especially Doug McIsaac. So now, let us all live by John's words. Let's have fun. There's a great clip on YouTube with Carl Jung discussing uh, the best way to face death. And he basically says, ignore it. Um, that uh, you should just live each day fully and as though you're going to go on and on so that you stay upbeat and optimistic. And um, that's harder to do when someone is wonderful and young and vital and um, powerful as John is taken so soon, too, too soon. And I'm just really grateful to him. I want to say thank you, John, for all you did for, uh, for us as a, as a guild. I, I know you've, you've made huge... Um, impacts on people's lives, uh, in family life, in business life, in professional life, in, in your service, in your church work. Uh, I, I, I know you as a guy who, who virtually gave his health so that we would have a, a strong guild and be able to provide uh, thousands of families with 
fantastic health care and uh, and retirement plans and uh, and workers rights and just really lifted up the middle class you were you came from that background and you um, you cared about us and you I mean I, I watched your health deteriorate because of the sacrifice you made uh, in leadership to to uh, to look out for us so thank you for that and uh, there's a verse in uh, Psalms which I know that you loved in Psalms I don't know which verses you liked but uh, happy is the man, praiseworthy is the man whose God is uh, trust is in the Lord, and that the reason for that I think is that when you have trust in a higher power, it allows you to take risks and to do brave, courageous things because you believe something greater has your back. And I, man, you had our back, and the, the sacrifices and the risks that you took for us, um, I, I don't know how you did it, even with faith. So, thank you, thank you. Uh, you're going to be missed, and you're going to be welcomed. And uh, love you, man. Take care.
Hi, Jude. Hi, Stan. How you doing? That was beautiful. That was beautiful. That was very, very touching. Oh, God. Yeah. Dan did a good job. She did a good job. Very nice job. Yeah, she really did. She had thought about it. Look, look good. And it sounded, you know, it was very appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I know. I was wondering if the others will join us. If Colleen or uh, Johnny or whatever, Johnny Bowman or whatever. Uh, Johnny's it's a past midnight there in Ireland. So I know. I know. I know. But he's still on. Uh, is he still on? He may have just left. He may have just said, Trisha's on. Um, let me see who else is on. Um, yeah, Johnny Bowman's still on. Your daughter, Shannon's on. Okay. Yeah. So let's see if we can get them to, to, to uh, unmute. unmute themselves. I don't see, uh, Ka uh, Kalen, Kelly must have been on with Kalen, but Oh, there's our AJ. Hi, AJ. Hey, guys. Hi, honey. Hi, AJ. That was nice, huh? So nice. That was nice. Yeah. Yeah, that was excellent. That was excellent. And um, I'm glad that oh, you enjoyed yeah. it. We just, we just received today the beautiful wedding invitation. It's beautiful, AJ. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there. It'll be quite an event. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please, please reconsider, Karen Stan. Please think about coming. And uh, it's, it's well, we will. I'm getting, we're getting a, you know what? We're losing our signal. It says low battery. So we'll be back. We'll get in touch with you soon, okay? Great. Hi, May. Oh, now I see Macy. Hi, Macy. Yeah. Hi. Great. Hi, Sorry. Tell, please tell Nikki, uh, you know, he did such an amazing job. And we love it. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi. I got, Hi. I I was Where's an hour that? late. I didn't get on until a little after seven. Yeah. Oh, oh you that. missed it. It was very good. It was very that good. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Arthur's here. He's he's gone. Hi, Johnny. How's Ireland? Hello. As Hi, a heads up, the broadcasting to all the 50 odd people who are uh, tuned in to this. Yeah. Uh, but hello, everyone. Hi, this is the family. <laughs> it was quite a tribute. Quite a tribute, yeah. Johnny. Yeah. Very, very nice. And Nikki, I'm with uh, Zoe here. Oh, hi. Hi, hi, Zoe. 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 Hi, Zo
but have a how just real quick how's the weather is it nice over, is it nice weather you've got good weather it showers like every hour on the <laughs> hour but yeah. uh, you know yeah. it comes and goes it's it's been, you know it's, it's been really yeah, nice that's why it's called the Isle. yeah well enjoy i'm gonna go johnny thank you for sending me that love to you all and um yeah. boy what a, what a and marvel talk, whoever talk whoever talks to shannon first and nikki tell them that they're yeah. both an excellent job excellent job excellent job okay thank you aunt judy okay thank you. So, so so johnny did you did you get to dublin at all are you going to dublin at all johnny Oh, uh no we're not we're not and i <laughs> you're gonna miss patty with any pub i'm not i'm laughing because this is <laughs> this is all being recorded right now oh, I'm that's being funny. To everyone who uh <laughs> who who is interested in partaking uh who wasn't able to be here as part of my dad's memorial but i'm so glad they're seeing this because <laughs> that's this good. Is, hey that's good that's this is good. incredible <laughs> <laughs> I like it because we're on somebody else's Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like you know, it's, it's like trespassing after after hours. <laughs> hey, hey, Johnny, Johnny, do you know how do we get to see the recording? Do you know? Uh, there's going to be a uh, a link that gets sent out, and I I will send. I'll make sure the, the link is sent out to y'all. Right. I don't know yeah, uh, yeah. how that's going to sent out right now. Awesome. Gabby and Nick are on their way down to Washington, so they weren't able to, to watch Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll send that out. Excellent. Well, you guys look great. It was good. Hi. Wonderful. You guys did a wonderful job. Thank See you. See you all soon. Patrick, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I give my best to them. That's great. Hey, Patrick, I was wondering if that was you. That's your name. The hey, one Patrick. and only, Judy. The one and Hi. only. Yeah. How are you? Living the dream, Judy. Good. Have you been in the Have you been in the lake yet? Is it warm enough? No, it's not warm, but we've been in it many, many times. Very good. Very yeah, good. Nick wanted to squeeze as much summer in over the last three weeks before he left for Washington. So it was cold, but we got in. Excellent, excellent. And what's and what is Nick doing now for the summer? Is it an internship? At the NIH. Oh, oh, how exciting! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, wow, that's very wow. Yeah, well, we missed everybody at the wedding. It was very yeah. Lovely. We missed you guys. We yeah. heard wonderful, wonderful things about it. So we're yeah, looking forward fun. to seeing more pictures soon. Yeah, we're waiting for the the, the photographs from the photographer and all that. But what we have has been lovely. What you know, fun pictures thus far. Right. It right. was fun. It was a fun time. Okay, my dears. All right, everybody, take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Goodbye from Sligo. Have fun in Sligo. Thank you. Bye, honey. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, Johnny. Hey, yeah. Can are you? Do you, your mom said you're going to be doing like the wild, the, like the real wild west of Ireland? You're gonna get. You're gonna go out to the Aran Islands. We will be. Yes. You're taking those. Um, trying to remember the the the, the those uh, the boats that they. Uh, some kind of, it's some kind of a curag or so the yep the special yep we'll be taking those up. wow i hear that's quite the ride well yeah can't wait it's open ocean it's open atlantic ocean get getting from where we depart from from i i don't remember where the where that port is but yeah so um, it's Galway, yeah yeah have fun yeah thank you thank you Brush up your Gaelic. Yeah, right. I, you know, do they still speak only Gaelic on the island? That was a. No, they. I mean, I've been there before. They, oh, yeah. they, they speak English, but it's a choice. It's a choice. Yeah, yeah. Sounds great. Sounds great. I'm jealous. Have yeah. a great time. Have a great time. Take a lot of pictures. Send them. Send them to us. Yeah, we have lots of good ones already. Send them to us. We'd love to see them. Okay. All right, Aunt Judy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good night, kids. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.